Our scripture reading today is from 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And the congregation says, Amen. Amen. I don't know this thing. I'm not used to that <clears throat> kind of microphone. They call them wireless, but there's a lot of wires on me. <laughs> I, n- I never thought I'd live to uh, say these words when I was a youngster, but decades ago, I remember, <laughs> I was preaching in a farming community, and one of the older members there, one of the farmers, would um, every Sunday fall asleep during my sermon. (laughs) You can imagine what that does to your ego a little bit. And it it did bother me actually a little bit, so I was talking to an older, wiser preacher one time about it, ask him, you know, what should I do? And he said, he makes it a point to be there every week, and he's asleep, so it's going right into his subconscious. <laughs> and it totally changed my mind about that. I thought that was really great. Now, as I mentioned, that was decades ago, so I'm decades older now. I find it very easy to go home in the afternoon or the evening and sit in my chair and fall asleep. I've, I've learned to appreciate that nap. Now, I said all that to say this. I'm going to make an extra hard effort. I don't know about you, but I'm going to try not to doze off during the sermon today. That would be kind of a disaster. Seeing the righteousness. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember ah, there we go. uh, A show that was on some years ago, TV show. It was, I think, a pretty good show. Had interesting plots good messages, good lessons in it, called uh, Quantum Leap. I've started re-watching that, and every once in a while I kind of think, I I think I remember this one, and I have to watch through to wait and see. Well, one of the episodes, uh, as Sam Beckett has jumped into someone else's life, and he's trying to teach lessons and set history right, you know the story if you've seen the, the show, But at one point he mentions to a lady, he says, once you've seen the light, you cannot go back into the darkness. Now that is taken right from scripture. I don't know if you recognize that or not, but Jesus talked about that. And in John 12, 46, he says, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. The whole point is it's a matter of seeing. Jesus once talked about people who were listening to his parables, and he told his disciples, having eyes they do not see, and having ears they do not hear. Now, he wasn't saying they're blind or deaf. He said they're not perceiving, they're not understanding, and they're not comprehending what's really being said. In our world, we encounter people all the time, and we may not realize what we're looking at. Some people, when they, you think about seeing, they see with soft eyes. You can see the compassion in their eyes, the kindness. Other people are more logical. They're looking at it more with a perceptive and a focused look. But you know there are people out there, they just refuse to see. They have their eyes closed. And that's the kind of people Jesus was talking to his disciples about. They don't really see what's happening. Well, it's not that they're not observing with their eyes. I remember as a youngster, I'd help my dad or my grandpa or my uncles do work on cars or tractors or something. And 
And they'd have all the tools laid out on the bench and they'd say, go get me that 9 16 wrench. And sometimes I didn't know what it was they were asking for, so I'd walk over there and kind of rattle some stuff around and I'd guess at one and take it over there. And they're like, no, not that. Well, it wasn't that I didn't see it. I saw what they were asking for, but I didn't know what it was. And once I was taught, then I knew what a 9 16 wrench was. So we have these ideas of things that we see, but we have to look with a little more understanding. Think about this picture. This is a stereotypical picture. Would you say that's a picture of an angel? Is that an angel? Well, most people would say, sure. Well, what about this picture? Is this an angel? Most people would say, no. But what if I told you that's a picture of Satan? In 2 Corinthians 11:14, Paul writes and says, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. We have to be careful what we're looking at and what we decide it is. This other picture, Hebrews 13, 2 says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, I don't know either one of those pictures what they really could or couldn't be or are or are not, but it's possible we need to have our eyes a little more open to the possibilities. When we go back to 2 Kings, the Aramaeans have sought to capture Elisha, and he and his servant have gone to the city of Dothan. And if you haven't read this chapter in a while, I encourage you to do that this afternoon. It's fascinating. And it's really insightful into what God can do for us. Well, the Arameans have sent what Scripture calls a great army overnight and have camped around surrounding the city of Dothan. In the morning, the servant wakes up, and I see this picture in my mind of what's happening, and it's just as it should be. The servant is up early, getting things ready for Elisha to take care of him for the day. And he looks out over the morning and he sees this great army surrounding the city. Now, if you read the scripture, what he says is, what shall we do to Elisha? Now, what he means is, we are in trouble. I think we all find ourselves in that kind of situation at some point in our life, if not more than once. We may not be surrounded in a city by a, an enemy army, but we sometimes in our lives get surrounded by trials, distress, uncertainty, turmoil in relationships, difficulties in various aspects of our life. And sometimes we ask that question, what am I gonna do? And we're thinking, I'm in trouble. I need something to be fixed. Well, back to Elisha, he knows it's not quite as bad as the servant thinks. It's not as distressing as the situation looks to the physical eye. So he prays to God that God will open the eyes of his servant and he sees then the righteousness of God at hand. And it changes the whole situation. Verse 17 says that this, this servant saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. See, they were there all along, but the servant couldn't see them until God opened his eyes. We need to let God open our eyes too. <clears throat> I can't see that screen down there. <laughs> so I'm gonna jump back up here, okay. There we are. What we find is, if we let God open our eyes, it will change the way we see the world. And in turn, it will change our commitment to the way we live. And then we can change the world. How big that scope is within our family, within our community, within our nation, within the whole world, it'll change. 
Let's switch to this. Uh, yep, okay, good. Oh, we already are, so we're good. We'll just make this easier. Okay. Terry actually uh, touched on this a couple of weeks ago when I was thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> this lesson I've been thinking about for a while, he's going to uh, make me have to change. But he just, it was just a portion, so I left mine alone. But 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. I think we've heard that and we comprehend it pretty often. But there's a reason, and the reason is the rest of the verse, so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's a powerful passage. And it really tells us something about who we are. It does, of course, encourage us, just like Paul kind of rewords this in Ephesians 4 and verse 1, to walk worthy in a manner of the calling with which we are called. If we understand that God has done this for us so we might become the righteousness of God, it changes the way we live. And that's important because it determines the way the world sees God. We've heard many of those cliches, you're the only gospel some people see, and that's really true. So it is important that we take this seriously. In Galatians chapter six and verse 10, it ties into this idea of us being the righteousness of God, and it says, so then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now you could read that passage and sometimes it's hard not to say, oh, why? They don't treat me very nicely, those other people, whether they're in the household of faith or just everybody out there in the world. And we know the world can treat us pretty rough sometimes. But it's not because of the way they treat us. It's because of who we are. We are the righteousness of God. That's an incredible statement. And that's why we do what we do. That's why we do good to all people. But did you ever think about it this way? It does say we might become the righteousness of God. That means I am the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. But think about all the other people around you right now. It changes the way we see them. They are the righteousness of God. No wonder God tells us to be uni unified as a body of Christ, to love our brothers, to put one another ahead of ourselves. Why? Because that person you're looking at is the righteousness of God. Unbelievable that God has done that for us, but he has. We are all the righteousness of God. It's like some people talk about forgiveness. Oh, I don't forgive them because it's good for them. I forgive them because it's good for me. It's the same thing with this righteousness. We don't act as God's righteousness in the world because it's good for the world. It is, but that's not the reason. We do it because that's who we are. God has made us the righteousness. Think of those things that we talked about that disturb us, that we sometimes go, oh no, what am I going to do? The stresses, the trials, the tribulations, the difficulties in relationships, whether they're close or around in our community, the people we have trouble with. It changes how we react when we realize if they are people of the world, well, I do it because I am the righteousness of God in their eyes. And if it's people within the body of Christ, does that not change the way you think about how you're going to act and react to that person who is the righteousness of God? Well, I know this is far easier said than done because sometimes I don't act like the righteousness of God very well. But I count on you to be the righteousness of God and continue to treat me the way I should be treated and hopefully I realize, uh-oh, I'm not displaying the righteousness of God, so I better correct that. 
We term it in different ways all the time, but that's a new, it's a new way to kind of put it into perspective. How do we reach that point, though? Well, of course, first we have to start by obeying the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17, Paul put it this way. I keep forgetting about this. I should have put little notes in here to press the button. Sorry. <laughs> you can tell I've not done the PowerPoint during lessons too much before. But Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Pick up on this phrase that you've seen many times before. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. It kind of gives us a new view of it, of what it is to be the righteousness of God. We miss so many of the blessings if we're not in that relationship with God. It's incredible to try to comprehend everything he has done for us and what he has made us. To stop and think, we look through scripture and we see the idea of God and his righteousness and then to suddenly re re realize when God opens our eyes to this truth that we are his righteousness. Hopefully that changes the way we look at the world and the way we look at one another. And then, of course, the way we walk from day to day. If you're not the righteousness of God. It's easily remedied by obeying the gospel. A little bit later in the book of Romans, Paul talks about how we accomplish that. He says, we're buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. A new life where we are the righteousness of God. We have a huge impact on the world that we live in. Often, I think we don't realize it, Constantly, the world does not realize it. But we change things for the better. We hold back the tide of evil. And we do that in so many different ways. Our prayers that we offer up to our Lord to change the world. Hopefully, you appreciate what God has done for you in a way not as, as a matter of gratitude so much, of course that's obvious, but appreciate it in a way that you put it to work. To take advantage of that opportunity to take things before God's throne, to change the world, to walk in the world as his righteousness. If you haven't yet obeyed the gospel and you want to do that, we want to offer that opportunity. If you haven't been living up to this potential that God has granted us to be his righteousness here on earth. Today's the day to change that, to change that commitment that you have and make a big difference in this world. If you need anything at this time, we want to offer you that opportunity while we stand together and sing.